Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to my office. Uh, <laughs> um, on Wednesday, the 24th of January, Jill is uh, not here today because she is in uh, on a train to London. Um, um, the church today, yeah, welcome to morning prayer. The church today is celebrating uh, St. Francis de Sales, Bishop of Geneva and teacher of the faith from um, 1622. So I'll read a little bit about him. Born into an aristocratic family at Thorens, th I'm going to mangle this pronunciation, Thorens, or is it Thorens? Who knows? In Savoy in 1567 and educated in Paris and Padua, uh, Francis turned from the law to ordain ministry despite opposition from his family. Francis was appointed provost of Geneva, but he was based at Annecy, where the seat of the Geneva diocese had been transferred after the city of Geneva had rejected Roman Catholicism and embraced the reformed faith. So one of Francis's major tasks was to attempt the conversion of the Genevans to the Roman Catholic faith. At the Pope's request, he even went into the city of Geneva to interview Calvin's successor, Theodore Beza. In theological debate, he gained a reputation for his courtesy, civility and good manners. Though many of the inhabitants of the Chablais region, region uh, returned to the Roman fold, most Genevans remained firm in the reformed faith. But their respect for Francis was uh, diminished neither by his different understanding of the Christian faith nor by his attempts to convince them of its rightness. One Calvinist minister in Geneva said of Francis, if we honoured any man as a saint, I know no one since the days, uh, if we honoured any man as a saint, I know no one since the days of the apostles more worthy of it than this man. Despite his personal opposition, Francis was appointed coadjutor bishop, which is basically assistant bishop, in 1599. And three years later, when the diocesan bishop died, he succeeded him as bishop of Geneva. He was a model bishop. He revised and implemented catechetical instruction. He was conscientious in parish visitation, despite the mountainous nature of his diocese. His goodness, patience and mildness became proverbial. He demonstrated a practical love for the poor and kept his own food plain, his dress and his household simple. He wrote a number of books and treaties, treatises, treatises, gosh, my brain this morning, treatises, treatises, treatises. <laughs> one of his best known being an introduction to the devout life in 1609, a work intended to make the principles of Christian piety available for all. Everyone should strive to become pious, and it is an error, it is even a heresy to hold that piety is incompatible with any state of life. It was a book later read and, re and valued by John Wesley. Francis died on a visit to Lyon in 1622, and crowds flocked to visit his remains, which the people of Lyon were an anxious to keep in their city. Uh, the compromise reached was that his body was brought back to Annecy, but his heart was interred. His physical heart was interned at Lyon. Uh, that's Francis, and I think that's very relevant to the uh, week of prayer for Christian unity at the moment. That this was a Roman Catholic bishop who was who was um, valued for his <laughs> good manners and working well with in his um, diocese, which was mainly made up of. Um, people from reformed tradition so that's a good nice model of um different um dialogue and working well uh, together across different um uh, different christian denominations and so we pray for uh we'll pray for the churches working together in wolverton as well um today um but let's still our hearts as we come before god in prayer this morning O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Your light springs up for the righteous, and all the peoples have seen your glory. Blessed are you, sovereign God, King of the nations, to you be praise and glory forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, your name is proclaimed in all the world. As the sun of righteousness dawns in our hearts, anoint our lips with the seal of your spirit, that we may witness to your gospel and sing your praise in all the earth. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. 
The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you now and forever. Amen. Psalm 45. Behold our defender, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. My heart is astir with gracious words. As I make my song for the king, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are the fairest of men, full of grace are your lips, for God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, gird on your majesty and glory. Ride on and prosper in the cause of truth, and for the sake of humility and righteousness. Your right hand will teach you terrible things. Your arrows will be sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, so the peoples fall beneath you. Behold our defender, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. Your throne is God's throne forever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. You love righteousness and hate iniquity. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. All your garments are fragrant with myrrh, aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, the music of strings makes you glad. King's daughters are among your honourable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Behold our defender, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. Hear, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people and your father's house. So shall the king have pleasure in your beauty. He is your lord, so do him honour. The people of Tyre shall bring you gifts. The richest of the people shall seek your favour. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is an embroidered cloth of gold. She shall be brought to the king in raiment of needlework. After her, her, after her the virgins that are her companions. With joy and gladness shall they be brought and enter into the palace of the king. Instead of your fathers you shall have sons, whom you shall make princes over all the land. I will make your name to be remembered through all generations. Therefore shall the peoples praise you for ever and ever. Behold our defender, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. Lord our God, bring your bride, your holy church, with joy to the marriage feast of heaven, and unite us with your anointed Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains tremble in the heart of the sea, though the waters rage and swell, and though the mountains quake at the towering seas. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place of the dwelling of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, therefore shall she not be removed. God shall help her at the break of day. The nations are in uproar and the kingdoms are shaken, but God utters his voice and the earth shall melt away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come and behold the works of the Lord, what destruction he has wrought upon the earth. He makes wars to cease in all the world. He shatters the bow and snaps the spear and burns the chariots in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. God of Jacob, when the earth shakes and the nations are in uproar, speak and let the storm be still through Jesus Christ our Lord. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Now, our first reading is from um, Genesis chapter 14. There's quite a few fun names in this one, so bear with me. <laughs> um, in the days of King Amraphel of Shinar, King Arioch of Elisar, King Kedalaima of Elam, and King Tidal of Goyim, these kings made war with King Bera of Sodom, King Bersha of Gomorrah, King Shinab of Adma, King Shemaber of Zeboyim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is the Dead Sea. For twelve years they had served Kedalaima, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Kedalaima and the kings who were with him came and subdued the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shavah Kiriathaim, and the Horites 
in the hill country of Seir as far as El Paran on the edge of the wilderness. I don't know where any of these places are. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and subdued all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who lived in Hazazon Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out. And they joined battle in the valley of Sidim with king Kedileima of Elam, king Tidal of Goyim, king, king Amraphel of Shinar, and king Ariok of Elasar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their possession provisions, and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who lived in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, um, brother of Eshkol and of Anna, these were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his nephew had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and routed them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the goods and also brought back his nephew Lot with his goods, and the women and the people. After his return from the defeat of Kedileima and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And king Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him one tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, maker of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours, so that you might not say I've made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Anna, Eshkol and Mamre. Let them take their share. So basically, there was a lot of long um, and long names in that, but <laughs> the general idea is that two groups of kings, um, on one side you've got uh, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. On the other side, you've got Kedileima and his crew. Um, they fought. Kedileima won and took away, took out, took the possessions of, took a load of booty from Sodom and Gomorrah, including Lot, who was living there. And then uh, Abram, Abram goes and rescues Lot. So um, it's... Yeah, I guess it's sort of a, <laughs> a military story. Um, and um, I think one of the things that struck me, the thing that struck me was not the military <laughs> aspect of the story, um, which is uh, interesting at the moment, but um, it was Melchizedek because he's quite a, an interesting figure. Um, He's quite a, a sort of a mis mysterious figure in many ways, um, but he is a priest and a king. And so he's sort of that forerunner for the idea of the, of the, um, um, of the Messiah as priest and king. And therefore, you know, the, 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 the precursor to the idea of, um, of, of Jesus being both a high priest and a king and the royal, the idea of the royal priesthood, um, which is talked about in the Bible. <laughs> I'm not going to quote verse. Um, so, and even more, he sort of appears <laughs> in this story from nowhere, it seems, and comes and um, blesses Abram, Abram and um, 
um, and and offers him. Um, he brings out bread and wine and um, shares a meal. And uh, it's it's in some ways it's quite um, it's not that's not a surprise because um, it is common for meals to be shared when um, military treaties and negotiations are happening. Um, people will share a meal, make sacrifices, necessary sacrifices to um, to God for what's been done and that kind of thing. Um, but the interesting thing, something that's interesting is actually that there's no meat. It's just bread and wine. Normally you'd have meat for the sacrifices, particularly um, with Melchizedek being a high priest. So there's meat missing from this meal. It's meagre. It's very plain. Um, and that's what makes it interesting because there's that link with um, that we can see with the Eucharist and Jesus's last meal with his disciples, where obviously the sacrifice then will be Jesus himself. Jesus is the kind of meat of that um, sacrifice in a very different way um, and is the one sacrifice for all on the cross. Um, so that's kind of <laughs> just a bit of uh, interesting, uh, interesting, maybe hopefully interesting thoughts. Um, Oh, Hillary. Oh, thanks, Hillary. Uh, I did my best. <laughs> Some of them were a bit of a tongue twister. Um, and then one more interesting thing I thought was that Abram didn't take any spoils from the war. He didn't profit from it. He didn't profit from his military exercise. He was under oath with God not to profit from the military action. Um, and only to save, to get go rescue Lot. So, um, I guess praying for peace, for an end to war at the moment, and for leaders of nations not to go into war for profit. Um, anyway, if anyone else has any thoughts about that reading, please do put it in the comments. Um, otherwise, I will go on to the catacomb. Above you, the Holy One arises, and above you, God's glory appears. Arise, shine out, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is rising upon you. Though night still covers the earth and darkness the peoples, above you, the Holy One arises, and above you, God's glory appears. The nations will come to your light, and kings to your dawning brightness. Your gates will lie open continually, shut neither by day nor by night. The sound of violence shall be heard no longer in your land, or ruin and devastation within your borders. You will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. No more will the sun give you daylight nor moonlight shine upon you. But the Lord will be your everlasting light. Your God will be your splendour. For you shall be called the city of God, the dwelling of the Holy One of Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Above you, the Holy One arises, and above you, God's glory appears. And our second reading is from Matthew, chapter 26. So then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, 
Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Gosh, so we're coming to the um, into the very um, intense part of the end of Matthew's gospel um, with the portrayal of Jesus. And I think this passage is incredibly, incredibly powerful and shows us something really poignant about the, the humanity of Jesus. And it really gets across that level of emotion, potentially fear, potentially worry, anxiety, grief, that Jesus is going through as he wrestles with what he now knows is being um, asked of him to make that sacrifice. And that humanity in him kind of wrestling with what's about to happen, what he knows is about to happen, but what he knows he needs to do. And then at the same time, his disciples, who he's asked to be <laughs> there with him whilst he struggles and wrestles with this, um, just fall asleep. And the first time he says, he sort of comes to Peter and says, you couldn't, could you not stay awake with me one hour? Um, and sort of makes that plea um, to the disciples, please stay awake with me. And then the second time when he goes and finds them sleeping, it's almost as if he goes, OK, they really need the rest. He doesn't even try and wake them up. He leaves them being, goes away and prays a third time and then wakes them up when it's really necessary for them to be awake. So you've got that real sense of struggle, the humanity, both in his struggle and wrestling with what's about to happen, but also in his um, in his both in his um in his pleading with his friends to be there for him, but also in his kindness and um, allowing them to sleep the second time and letting them sleep because he knows they need to. It's, yeah, the one night the disciples can't stay awake. It's customary um, on Passover night to stay awake and um, I believe to stay awake and talk about um, the um, God's acts of um, redemption, salvation, but um, the difference is this night uh, it's Jesus himself who will be part of that, well, be that act, that new act of um, redemption. And it's the one night the disciples can't stay away. Um, yeah, so that's just uh, my thoughts about that. It's an incredibly, incredibly powerful passage. It makes me feel really emotional uh, whenever I read this bit. Um, but I will move on to the responses. I worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before him. Tell it out among the nations that the Lord is king. I worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tell out his salvation from day to day. Let the whole earth tremble before him. Declare his glory among the nations and his wonders among all peoples. I worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before him. A gospel canticle. Those who are wise will shine as brightly as the heavens, and those who have instructed many in virtue will shine like stars for all eternity. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. A new child shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. 
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Those who are wise will shine as brightly as the heavens, and those who have instructed many in virtue will shine like stars for all eternity. So let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this new day. We ask, Lord, that you be with us, be strengthening us in all that you would have us do today, that we may act according to your will, be given strength to do those things, all the things that we need to do. We pray, Lord, that we will see you in every person we meet, every person we encounter. We pray, Lord, that you will uphold us all with your love. Today, for today, as, uh, as we remember um, Saint Francis de Sales, um, we we give you thanks for his work as Bishop of Geneva in his um, in his work amongst um, work together with uh, people of different denominations and different understandings of the Christian faith. And in this week of prayer of Christian unity, we pray and give thanks for the work of all different. Uh, all the different uh, churches and Christian denominations working in and around Wolverton and Milton Keynes. Pray for churches together in Wolverton. We pray for churches together in Milton Keynes and we give you thanks for all the work that all the churches do in working together in spreading your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we read about Abraham, Abraham and his um, rescue of Lot, we pray for all places in the world which are um, which are in um, involved in conflict. We pray for the leaders of all nations that they would work for peace. We just pray. We cry out, Lord, for your peace. We pray for particularly for um, Russia and Ukraine, for Palestine, Israel, for all innocent people who are caught up in conflict, who have lost homes, who have been displaced, who have nowhere to go. We pray for the dignity of all, for resources and the basic human needs of all to be respected and delivered upon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we've heard about Jesus's night in Gethsemane, of his struggle and wrestling with what was about to happen, we pray for all who are struggling and wrestling at the moment. Pray for those who are wrestling with illness with anxieties, with worries. We pray for those who are sick, those who are dealing with grief, those who are lonely. We offer, Lord, all those things that we are worried about today. And we offer to you, Lord, all those people who need your, who need you, who need our prayers, who need your closeness. We pray, Lord, for all those who have lost loved ones, and those who are pre- preparing for funerals. Pray for all those who will have a funeral today. And those who will have funerals over the next few weeks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O 
holy God, who called your bishop, Francis de Sales, to bring many to Christ through his devout life and to renew your church with patience and understanding. Grant that we may, by word and example, reflect your gentleness and love to all we meet. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Believing the promises of God as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May Christ, who sends us to the nations, give us the power of his spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. I hope you will have a good day and a, a lovely weekend. And um, I will see you uh, next week because Jill is on reading week. Uh, so you will have <laughs> lots of me next week. But uh, God bless and have a lovely weekend. Bye. <laughs>